the introduction. Thank you for inviting me here. Uh, this is quite a unique uh, venue. I've never spoken in a gallery of sculpture before, and uh, uh, many of the sculptures here I know and love, so uh, this is quite a unique experience for me. Uh, so thank you again to the organizers and to, uh, to everybody who helped put this together. Over the last 250 years or so, the human race has been running an experiment. Really an experiment on what social, economic ideas work and what social, political, economic ideas don't work. And by work I mean what ideas lead to human success, to longer life, to more wealth, to the poor doing better, and what ideas lead to death and destruction. And the experiment is fairly, I think, obvious to anybody who really, honestly, is willing to study history and to look at the facts as they are. 250 years ago, pretty much everybody on the planet was poor. There was a small group of aristocrats who were doing pretty well, and everybody else was poor. Most of us were subsistence farmers, which means we farmed and ate what we produced, and that was about it. No surplus, no saving, no vacation, no holidays, no restaurants. All, by the way, modern concepts. And something happened about 250 years ago. This new experiment in a new political, social system was tried for the first time. You know, if you do a, a, a graph of uh, wealth per capita or income per capita, it doesn't really matter. And this is much simpler than anything you can't write, so don't worry. If you do a graph, I'm going to do it in the air here, right? And you start at, let's say, uh, 10,000 years ago. And you look at income per capita, wealth per capita. And hopefully you can see me in the back. I'll do it up here, so you can see me, right? Wealth and income per capita are basically flat and flat and flat. They are fluctuate a little bit, like Rome is a little bit of an uptick. And then the Dark Ages are downtick, and then it's up again during uh, the late Middle Ages, and they start going up a little bit. But it's tiny, tiny variations. And then, suddenly, it goes like that, exponentially up in the West. And what is the date in which it starts going up like that? Like sometime in the late 18th century. I like 1776. For two reasons. Establishment of the United States of America, the, the first real political body that represents this new experiment of freedom. And a book is published in 1776. Anybody know what book? Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. The first, if you will, real book of economics articulating the case for capitalism. And whether you think it's flawed or not is irrelevant to the historical fact that it was an incredibly important book at the time. And that's the beginning of capitalism. And through the 19th century, we came, in many parts of the world, close to capitalism, close to what I would consider pure capitalism, separation of state from economics, the protection of private property, the protection of individual rights. And we came, in some parts of the world, close to it. And what was the result? Incredible wealth creation. The poor rising up, so that by the end of the 19th century, Nobody is poor in England and in America as compared to the poor 100 years earlier. Life expectancy almost doubles. Quality of life across the entire income spectrum improves dramatically wherever capitalism is tried. And that is true in the 19th century, but it's also true in the 20th century because an interesting phenomenon in Asia, this graph of wealth per capita, income per capita, stays flat. And then suddenly goes like that about 30, 40 years ago, when they adopt elements of capitalism. 
In contrast to that, we have regimes, we have governments that have adopted anti-capitalism, communism, fascism, and the story there is always the same. Death and suffering by tens of millions of people, economic stagnation and collapse, poverty, no progress, no innovation, no success. And then we have lots of countries in the middle. Most of the West, during the at least post-Soviet era, some capitalism, some statism, we mix them up, right? Mixed economies. Most of the world today, almost all of the world today, is some form of mixed economy. And even when you see these mixed economies, what you can do is you can graph them. And you can say, how much economic freedom do they have? How much wealth per capita? How much income per capita? How successful are the people in those countries? And what you find is that it's a pretty direct correlation. The more economic freedom you allow people, the greater the income. In other words, the more capitalism you allow, the more private property you allow, the better off the economies do. The more successful people are. The wealthier people are. But this leads to a real mystery. If capitalism is this successful, if capitalism has been successful in the past and is so successful today, then why is it that so much of Europe and America are moving away from capitalism? And it's not just Europe and America, I was just in South America. And in South America you have two experiments going on. You have Chile, which during the 1980s and 90s became very pro-market, relatively economically free, and its economy has done fantastically well. The richest country in South America, even though it's a relatively small country in terms of population. Then you've got Venezuela, who is very rich in resources, but has adopted a populist, socialist governance, and where the population is becoming poorer and poorer and poorer almost every day. And yet, right now, as we speak, more countries in South America are trying to be like Venezuela than are trying to be like Chile. And indeed, Chile just recently voted for a socialist president who promised to undo all the free market reforms that have worked so well in Chile. Now that's a real mystery. It's very strange. If we care about wealth, if we care about quality of life, if we care about standard of living, if we care about how the poor are doing, we should all, all be capitalists. And yet, very few people are capitalists. I mean, capitalists in the, in the sense of advocating for a free market, consistent free market. Almost nobody is a capitalist. We have tiny, tiny minorities in almost every country around the world. And as I said, America and Europe are moving away from capitalism. More and more statism, more and more regulations, more and more redistribution of wealth. Latin America is moving away from capitalism in spite of the fact that they can see Venezuela. They can see people starving. They can see people leaving Venezuela and coming back and with suitcases full of toilet paper and soap because there's no toilet paper and soap in Venezuela because of the socialist policies. It doesn't change anybody's mind. Doesn't matter one iota. We hate capitalism. As a culture, we hate it. Now, Poland might, you might feel, eh, this isn't quite true of Poland. Yeah, because you've experienced communism recently enough that you're still moving in the right direction. Wait 10, 20 years. You'll get a little comfortable, you'll have a good life, and you'll vote for the socialists very quickly because that's the pattern of everywhere in the world. And I suspect you're not that different than the rest of the world. It's already happening. We don't even have to wait 10, 20 years, right? <laughs> so we have to ask the question why. We have to ask the question why because our future depends on it. Because if I'm right, and I'm open to challenges during the Q&A about whether I'm right, but if I'm right and capitalism is such a good system for wealth creation, 
for income, for standard of living, for the poor, and so on. Then why are we turning our backs on it? Why do we resent it and hate it so much? And we do hate it. Right? When the financial crisis happened in the United States, before anybody had an opportunity to investigate, before anybody had an opportunity to check the economics of what happened, to look at the data, everybody knew who was at fault. Right? The headlines was what? Who caused the crisis? Capitalism. Capitalism. And who among the capitalists caused the crisis? Of all the capitalists out there, who do we hate the most? The rich. Well, not so much the rich, particular, particular kind of rich people. Who, are, who do we hate the most? Always. In the West, we always blame these guys for every economic crisis ever. The bankers, of course, bankers. We used to, we used to, you know, it used to be Jewish bankers, but now that's politically incorrect. So it's just bankers, right? We hate bankers, and we hate capitalism, even though there is no capitalism without banking. Banks, allocators of capital, are more responsible for the success of the modern world as any other single group, and yet we hate them. So what is it about capitalism we hate so much? What is it about free markets that we resent so much that we always turn our backs against it? Inequality. I don't think so because if you look, if you look at, if you look at the United States, nobody cares about inequality in the United States. Poll after poll shows that Americans don't care. They admire the rich. They want to be rich. They want to be like them. Envy is not what strike is. Something else, more fundamental, actually, I think, the cause of envy is right. So let me ask you. What's capitalism about? It's about hard work. Well, why do we work hard? I mean, it's not, it can't, the end can't be the hard work. What are we working hard to achieve? What's that? And proving God's life is a really nice way of saying it. What do, you, what do people go to work for? Money, to make money. I know it's a little embarrassing to say, right? And I can see it. It's embarrassing for you, it's embarrassing for every audience. It's so obvious. Like, why does Apple make this? To make a profit. The profit margin on this thing is 60%. If they cared about me, they could sell this a lot cheaper, right? They don't care about me. They care about profits. That's not just profit. You guys don't all go to work just for the profit, just for the money. What else is it about? It's about fun. It's about satisfaction. It's about passion. It's about doing something that you value, that you enjoy, that you have fun doing. Steve Jobs had a lot of fun with this. But what is this iPhone? Who was it made for? Who did Steve Jobs build this for? It was Steve Jobs to make money and to have fun. And it's a reflection of his passion. So producers in capitalism produce because it's good for them. It's because it's in their self-interest. They're being selfish. Right? We all know this, right? Business men are selfish. We're about to make money. Now, we as consumers, on the other hand, right? maybe not, right? Because when I went and bought my first iPhone in 2008, the U.S. economy is spiraling out of control, and I wanted to stimulate the U.S. economy. <laughs> <laughs> because that's why you go shopping. You go shopping to help your fellow man. You go shopping to make sure people have jobs. Why do you go shopping? To make your lives better. You're being self-interested. Markets. Markets, free or unfree. Markets are places in which we go to pursue our own interests. Our own self-interest. Markets are all about the pursuit of self-interest. Markets are all about people who are self-interested meeting together to exchange. And when I buy the iPhone, I'm better off. Why am I better off? This cost me three hundred dollars. How much is it worth to me? More than three hundred. Very good. Usually, I get three hundred dollars. No, if it was only three hundred dollars, I wouldn't go bother. Right? It's more than three hundred. So my life is better because I got something worth more than $300. 
and Apple, are they worse off? Because they lost an iPhone that's worth more than three hundred dollars. For them, the money is more important than the iPhone. So they made a profit, and I'm better off. By the way, that's all you have to know about inequality. Because by the way, when I bought an iPhone, inequality got worse. I got poorer by three hundred dollars, and Apple got richer by three hundred dollars. So inequality, based on how Piketty and all his followers measure it, just got worse. But that's stupid. I'm being nice. It's worse than stupid. It's dishonest. Because I didn't get poorer. I got richer. Because I got an iPhone worth more than three hundred dollars to me. So I'm richer, and Apple's richer. <coughs> but you can't measure that with data. Because you can't measure how much this is worth to me with data. Before. There's no more in which it's measurable. So all the entire inequality debate is a silly debate. And the entire way they, in which they measure inequality is a silly way of measuring it. Because of things like that. Alright. So capitalism is about the pursuit of self-interest. Why do we hate bankers? Because they pursue self-interest in a more obvious way than anybody else. Why do you go to work for a bank? Why does a bank exist? To make money. I can't even hide behind a pretty product like this. I can't say, oh, but look what I produced. I produced a pretty iPhone. <laughs> now, bankers make the iPhone possible, but that's an abstraction. That's many levels removed. So they can't defend themselves by hiding behind a product. Markets are about self-interest. And yet, what do we know about self-interest? Morally, ethically. What have we been taught since we were this big? And I know this is true because we're in Poland, which is Catholic. What were you taught about self-interest from this age? Is self-interest good, noble, virtuous? Did your mother tell you, always think about yourself first? Yeah, my mother never told me I was in the first place. Not morality. But when she taught me morality, she taught me, and I'm granted my mother's Jewish, but I think there's similarities between Jewish mothers and Catholic mothers. They both figured out how to use guilt effectively. Um, we'll get to guilt in a minute. No, I was taught, and I'm sure you were taught, whether it's explicitly or subliminally, if you want to be a good person, if you want to be moral, if you want to be a saint, you have to think of other people first. You have to think of yourself last. What is the, what is the essence of virtue in the culture we live in? It's selflessness. It's sacrifice. Sacrifice is noble. Sacrifice is good. We don't have any happy saints. To be a saint, you have to have suffered. You have to have arrows sticking out of you, right? Or be on a cross. The essence of our moral code is selflessness, self-sacrifice. Thinking of others, giving, sharing, contributing. That's good. Making money? Yuck. <laughs> You're being selfish. That's what morality tells us. I don't know any statues or any roads named uh, after successful capitalists. Lots of roads named after sacrifices. People who did it for the common good, for the public interest, for other people. That's what we name roads on. That's what we build sculptures for. Those of you who can't say about Moses on my left and the Pietà on my right. So, Let's take, take an example. Take Bill Gates. Everybody know who Bill Gates is Microsoft, right? Bill Gates built Microsoft. And in the process of building Microsoft, he made for himself $70 billion. That's $70 billion with a B dollars. Richest man in the world. How much more credit does he get for building Microsoft? I mean, morality, not business, everybody wants to be like him. You know, great businessman, everything. But more, right? Ethical credit for building Microsoft. 
How much small oak credit does he get? None. Or some negatives. Because how dare he make $70 billion? How many people did Bill Gates help when he built when he made Microsoft? How many lives did he change? Yeah, probably billions of lives. Bill Gates changed the world in profound, deep, meaningful ways. He changed the world. He made the world a better place for most of us to live. Most of humanity, not just most of us in this room. There's almost nobody on the planet that is not better off marginally because of Bill Gates. Let me ask you again, how much moral credit does he get for that? None. Zero. Negative. We liked, right? We, we liked it when the Justice Department in the United States went after him, knocked him down a little bit. The greedy bastard who made $70 billion for himself. When does Bill Gates become a good guy? Because now he's like, now we like him. From a moral perspective. When he leaves Microsoft, starts a foundation, and gives his money away. And he's giving his money away. Why do we like that? Because he's not making any money for himself. How many people is he going to affect by giving his money away? Maybe tens of thousands, maybe hundreds, maybe even millions. But less than at Microsoft. A lot less than at Microsoft. But here he gets more credit. Why does he get more credit for this? Because he's not being self-interested. Because it looks like he's just giving it away. Now we don't give him a lot of moral credit for this. Let's not exaggerate, right? He's still not a saint. We're not going to name roads after him. We're not going to create any sculptures for Bill Gates anytime soon. What? Why not? He's giving his money away. He's helping people. He's not benefiting himself. So why won't we consider him a moral giant? Two reasons. He's still got a lot of money. He's still rich. And the second reason is he's having fun giving it away. It looks like he's actually enjoying himself. So we're suspicious that maybe he's being self-interested, even when he gives his money away. Now notice that Bill Gates knows this. So when he gives his money away, he's chosen as its causes those causes that are most removed from his life as possible. So he lives in Seattle, but his philanthropy is not in Seattle. That would be selfish. His philanthropy is in Africa, as far away from Seattle as he could get. There are lots of people in need in Seattle that he could help in Seattle, but then he'd be accused of being selfish. So he has to go somewhere where he has no interest. Because our moral code says that to be virtuous, to be good, to be moral, you have to be selfless. You have to show sacrifice. You have to do stuff that you're not going to benefit from. If you benefit from it, it doesn't count. Moral. Now, so what would Bill Gates have to do to be commemorated in the sculpture? He'd have to give all his money away. He'd have to move into a tent. And if he could bleed a little bit, show a little bit of suffering, then we would make boulevards after him. So this is the moral code we live in today. It's a moral code that dominates the West. It's a moral code that says building, creating, making stuff, that's selfish, who cares? Giving it away, that's good. Sharing? That's good. We teach our kids. You know, your kid, I don't know how many of you have kids, but your kid is playing in the sandbox, right? And some strange kid comes up and says, I want to share with your trucks. I want to play with your trucks. And what do we as parents say? You got to share. Johnny, you got to share. Right? Don't trade. God forbid you should actually get something in return. No, you just got to give. You just got to share. That's socialism. We're training our little kids to be little socialists, and then we're surprised that when they grow up, they vote socialists. Next time, if you have kids, ask them to trade. Johnny wants to play with your truck? What does he have that you can play with? Right? Win-win. Just like Apple doesn't give these away, and you don't give your money away. We trade as adults. 
So, in my view, as long as this moral code exists, as long as we believe that the essence of morality, that the essence of goodness is sacrifice, selflessness, the essence of nobility is giving and sharing, capitalism is dead. Capitalism doesn't have a chance. And anytime we try it a little bit and we get a little rich, and then we start thinking not just about money, not just about our quality of life, but we start looking about what's good, we reject it. We turn our backs to it. Rich societies can afford to be moral societies. And when you can afford to be moral, you turn your back on capitalism. You turn your back on the system of self-interest, because that's what it is. We were taught self-interest is bad. Our philosophers teach us. Since Immanuel Kant, every philosopher has said self-interest is evil. Our preachers teach that. All of the religions teach that self-interest is bad. And our mothers teach it. And our teachers teach it. Now, no mother needs it, right? She doesn't actually need to think of yourself last. She wants you to be successful, and that was the point you were making, right? She wants you to be successful. But morality demands that you tell you, think of yourself last, think of others first, be selfless. This is a moral code consistent with the left. It's not consistent with freedom. It's not consistent with capitalism. And it cannot survive. Capitalism cannot survive. People do not vote their pocketbook. They don't vote what will make them money. People vote what will make them feel good. People vote justice. This is why Piketty and the whole inequality debate is framed in terms of justice. Not in terms of economics, but in terms of morality. People want to believe that they are good people, that they are just people, that they are virtuous people. So for example, in the United States, right, in California where I live, there was a ballot initiative that everybody voted on. And the ballot initiative said, we're going to raise taxes on rich Californians by 30%. So from 10%, to 13.3 percent, right? This is on top of the federal taxes. This is just state taxes. So a big increase in taxes for the rich. How do you think rich people voted? They voted for it. They voted for it. Why? Because they wanted to be good. They felt that it was necessary to penalize themselves in the name of morality. And they were told, oh, if you don't give us the extra tax money, we're going to have to shut down some schools, we're not going to have to pay for welfare, right? So, rich people vote for their own taxes to go up because they feel guilty for making the money. Because what happens when you live your life being self-interested, but you're taught that morality is really being, I don't know, Mother Teresa? But you, can't, you don't want to be Mother Teresa. Who the hell wants to be Mother Teresa? Nobody wants to be Mother Teresa. So we all live our lives, but we know that morality demands that we do something else. What, what, what is the emotion that that conflict creates? Guilt. And guilt is an incredible, powerful tool to control people. This is what Jewish and Catholic mothers discovered a long, long time ago. And what statists what rulers, what authoritarians have discovered a long, long time ago. You control people by using guilt against them. So rich people in the United States vote against their interests all the time because they feel guilty. They're told, you see over there, they're poor people, and they need stuff. You have money, it's your moral responsibility to give it to them. But you're too greedy, you're too selfish, you're not doing it voluntarily, so we are here from the government, and we're here to help you be a better person. You're not giving them money voluntarily, so we're going to raise your taxes. Do you agree with that? Yes, 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 please. Let me feel good about myself by raising my taxes. And it works. Obama, who ran for president last election, on the promise to raise taxes on the rich, how did the rich vote? Eight out of ten of the richest counties in the United States voted for Obama. They voted to raise their own taxes. But that's okay. It made them feel good. Because 
Now they were taking care of those people they're supposed to take care of, and they'd be neglected. So that's one way in which the welfare state, the redistribution state, is established because of morality, not because of politics, not because of economics. What about all the regulations, right? A big part of the state is regulation. Why don't we regulate business? Well, what do we be taught about self-interested people? What are we told that self-interested people will do? Steal, lie, and cheat. <laughs> anything. They will do anything. They'll exploit you. They'll take advantage of you. They are bad, bad people. Again, we've been taught this from when we were this big. Don't be selfish, because selfishness means lying, stealing, cheating, and exploiting. That's what the alternative we got in morality, because you can be selfless, or you can be a bastard. Right? Those are the only two alternatives we have. Right? And none of us want to be selfless, so we're a little bit bastards, and then we feel guilty about it. But if if selfish people are lying, stealing, and cheating, and we know that CEOs and bankers and business people are selfish, then what must they be? Just logically. They must all be potential lying, stealing, and cheaters. So we need to control them. We need to regulate them. We need to make sure that they behave themselves. Preemptive. Right? So in the United States, you walk into an elevator, and there's a little diploma on the wall that says this elevator is being inspected by a government bureaucrat and it won't fall and kill you. It doesn't literally say that, but that's the implication, right? Because we know that if we left it up to greedy businessmen, we left it up to greedy companies that make elevators, they would make elevators that kill you. Because the best way to make money under capitalism is to kill your customer. You laugh with this is the assumption. Why do we have food inspectors? Because if not food inspectors, who are doing it, by the way, for the public interest, they're not selfish. They're doing the government employees, so they're doing it for the public, you know, for your public good, and they have no interests here. If not for these food inspectors from the government, McDonald's would poison us, right? Those Polish sausages would be blah, 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 right? <laughs> That's the assumption, whether we think it's funny or not, it's the reality. We are bought into it as a culture. We think businessmen are inherently corrupt and we need to preempt them. We need to establish this whole regulatory structure, and it's massive today on the West, to protect us from these greedy bastards. And now there's a tension. We want these greedy bastards to make money because we realize that's how the economy grows. But we need to control them, so we need to increase regulations to make sure that they don't lie, steal, and cheat from us. So we get the regulatory state because of morality, and we get the redistribution state because of morality. Morality is the driving force towards statism. Morality is the driving force against capitalism. It's not economics, it's not history, it's not, it's not the reality. It's our moral beliefs. And you have to ask about our moral beliefs. Why? Why is being selfless good? Why is self-sacrifice good? Now nobody has an answer to that, because there is no reason. Why is the life of somebody else more important than my life? I have one shot at this life. Why should I place the interest of other people ahead of mine? There is no reason. There is no reason to sacrifice. There is no reason to be selfless. We we're here once on this planet. We have one shot at this. Why not try to make our lives the best lives that it can be? Why not try to live, live fully and completely? Why not be self-interested? Why is that not what morality is about? After all, Aristotle, the great Greek philosopher, he thought that's what morality was about. According to Aristotle, the purpose of morality is to teach us how to achieve eudaimonia. Eudaimonia means flourishing or happiness. It wasn't about sacrifice. It wasn't about being selfless. It was about being self-interested. 
in a way, what are the virtues and values that allow you to be self-interested in a way that achieves happiness, that achieves success, that achieves happiness? That's what Ayn Rand's message really is. It's we need to scrap the old morality. We need to get rid of the old moral code. And we need to establish a new moral code, a new moral code based on the idea that your life, your life is the most valuable thing to you. And then you have to figure out how to live that life. It's not easy. It's not easy to figure out what will lead to happiness and what won't. We need principles of morality to do it. And by the way, it turns out that lying, stealing, and cheating are not good for you. They're not good for you. Why not? Oh, they land you in jail often. That's pretty bad for you. They ruin your business. You try lying in business. Lying in business. People won't do business with you anymore. You try cheating in business. And the same in life. Try lying to your spouse on a regular basis. See what happens to your wife or husband. Doesn't work. It's a crummy, stupid strategy for succeeding. Except in politics. But that's because politics is force. And it's the one realm in which we expect lying, stealing, and cheating, and we don't mind it. But that tells you that something's corrupt, that something's bad, right? In business, we wouldn't tolerate it. In our personal life, we wouldn't tolerate it. Politics, we just go, ah, that's the way of the world, right? It tells you that politicians have way too much power, way too much power if we allow them to lie, steal, and cheat. So what we need is a new moral code. A moral code that helps guide individuals in pursuit of their own happiness, in pursuit of their own fulfillment. A moral code that recognizes that there are certain principles that are acquired in order to achieve success as a human being. But it's also true that each one of us is going to concretize, make real those principles in different ways based on our own personal values. They're going to be different. And that difference to express itself requires what? Freedom. It requires us to be free from somebody else telling us how to live and what to do and how to do it. But what is, what is the most important value for a human being to be successful in life? What is, it, what is the value that makes, well, this is a pretty good building to be in, that makes all this stuff around us possible? It makes our clothes possible, the chairs you sit on, the building, the sculptures, the iPhones that you have, or the Samsungs, whatever it is, right? What makes all of that possible? Yeah, there's only one thing that makes us uniquely human, that makes it possible for us to be successful as human beings. Because if you look around the room, you can look at each other, look around the room, we're a pretty pathetic animal. We're weak, we're slow, we have no claws, we have no fangs, right? You and the saber-toothed tiger, you would lose every time. And yet the saber-toothed tiger is in a museum, and you're all here. Because we won. How did we win? By using reason. Reason is what makes human life possible. Reason is what makes human progress possible. Reason is makes all other human values possible. So if we want to value something, if we care about our own happiness, our own flourishing, then we care about our reason. And this is why lying is such a stupid strategy. Because lying is deception. Reason is about facts and truth and reality. Lying is about the opposite. There's a term in computers, garbage in, garbage out. Well, lying is garbage. If you put it into this delicate machine, that I would call your brain, your mind, your reasoning capacity. If you put in garbage, you're going to get garbage. And you should care about your reasoning mind because it's the way in which you survive. It's the way in which you thrive. It's the thing, the faculty, that enables you to be successful in life. Now, what does reason require in order to thrive, in order to be successful, in order to really lead to human flourishing? What is the enemy of reason? What is the thing that, does, that stops reason from being able to lead to success? 
force, the gun. And this is why, this is the non-initiation of force principle that libertarians talk about. It's not pumped out of nowhere. It's the principle of reason needing to be free in order to be successful, in order to lead to progress, to success, to flourishing of the individual. You can't, your thinking is meaningless. And at the end of the day, you cannot think when you've got a gun pressed to your back. This is why there's no innovation in the communism. Why? How can you innovate? You don't know if you're going to piss off the regime or not piss off the regime. So you don't even try, because pissing them off means a bullet in the head. Or jail time. Authoritarian governments don't have progress. Not because of the politics, but because of the way the human mind works. The human mind cannot function under the threat of force. It shuts down. It's why we need to break the chains of the Catholic Church's domination of ideas in order to have an enlightenment, in order to have a scientific revolution. It's only when they move from burning people at the stake to house arrest to leaving people alone that we get an explosion in science. Post Newton, and even Newton was very careful in what he said, not to upset the wrong people. But at least Newton already knew that he was not going to be burned at the stake for discovering laws of physics. People 100 years earlier did not know that. What's that? The microphone's broken. Microphone's broken. Yeah, it looks like it's run out of batteries. It says hello. <laughs> One, two, three. No, oh, it's back. Maybe. <laughs> so reason requires freedom. Reason requires freedom, and the fact of individuals living for their own happiness, for their own lives, they require freedom. If I am an individualist, if I'm trying to attain my own happiness, my own success, I want to make choices for myself. I want to use my reason to guide my life. And I'll make mistakes. I'll fail. Steve Jobs failed more than once. And what am I free to do if I fail? Learn from it. Or not. Some people don't learn from their mistakes. And they suffer. And that's good. They deserve to suffer if they don't learn. If they don't use their mind. If they don't use their reason. Steve Jobs didn't. Steve Jobs learned from his mistakes. And as a consequence, it was a huge success. But if we don't let people fail, then they never learn. So as, an, as a person who cares about my own happiness, my own flourishing, my own success, the most important thing I want is to be left alone. Not left alone in the sense of out in the, in the forest without any other people around me, because people are incredibly valuable to my life. People are crucial value to me. They build iPhones that I can then trade for. Or they build sculptures that I can then enjoy. Not alone in that sense, but alone in the sense of free from people telling me how I should live, and not just telling me, forcing me to live the way they want me to live. Telling them, telling me which elevator I should use and which I shouldn't use. What clothes to wear and what not to wear. What food to eat and what not to eat. Who to marry and who not to marry. <laughs> it's true, right? You still don't allow gay marriage in public. None of anybody's business who I marry. It's a contract. She never said it was immoral to be gay. She didn't like the idea of being gay. She thought it was unnatural, but she never thought it was immoral. She never said it was immoral. Immorality depends on whether it's a choice or whether it's not a choice. And it wasn't, to her, it wasn't obvious that it was a choice. Immorality depends on your, you have to make a decision. Otherwise, you're going to win again. One, two, three. Do we have another one? Let's try it. One, two, three. There we go. Uh, morality is my choice. And by the way, I meant to be wrong. Not everything I meant said has necessarily been right. 
about any particular concrete. Philosophically, I think she's right about everything, but not on the necessarily on every application. So the fact that Einstein was wrong about something doesn't prove anything. Um, but the whole the whole point is that self-interested people, people who believe in a morality of self-interest, want freedom. They don't want mother government telling them what they can and cannot do. They don't want statism. Because statism, the essence of statism, is telling you what you can and cannot do. And unless, unless we replace the morality that we have today, unless we trash the morality of selflessness into the trash heap of history where it belongs, we will continue to suffer under status boot. We will continue to fluctuate between periods of relative freedom and abandonment of that freedom. Because we will never trust self-interest, which means we will never trust free markets, which means we will never trust capitalism, we will never trust the system that provides us the economic growth, the economic success, the economic prosperity. To get to the point where we trust it, to get to the point where we care about prosperity, where we get to the point where we care about freedom, we have to replace the morality of selflessness, of self-sacrifice, with the morality of individual flourishing, within the morality of rational self interest where reason is our primary value. So my book is called Free Market Revolution. But the revolution that I'm calling for is not a political revolution or even an economic revolution. What I'm calling for is much harder, much, much, much harder, because it goes to the very essential values of a culture. What I'm calling for is a moral revolution. A moral revolution for self-interest and as a consequence for capitalism. Thank you all. I'm sure you have questions. Yeah. Good. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. Is a morality of self-sacrifice. You've got Jesus up there on the cross, dying for not for his sins, that would be justice, but dying for your sins. And that's what makes him a God, if you will. Right? The fact that he's dying for other people's sins. And that is the symbol. That's what we should all strive towards. Sacrifice for other people. Now I know we're in a Catholic country, but that's the reality. The reality is. The Christian morality, in my view, is incompatible with capitalism. It's incompatible with freedom. Because it demands of you to sacrifice. Now we just... And capitalism is not about sacrifice. It's about exactly the opposite. Now I know that in modern times, Christianity has moved, if you will, particularly in America. I, I, I tell Christians in America, you're Americans first and Christians second. What you've done is you've taken your Christianity and made it America by making it okay to make money and to be capitalist and so on. But that's not, that's not really there. Um, your second question, remind me again. What's that, remind me again? Oh yeah, politicians, oh, yeah, politicians, but I would like to end this, this question. As, as I said, uh, in their own interest is to increase the status and have as much power on our lives uh, as possible. 
And uh, as we have seen, even when there, there were politicians who were claiming they are for freedom, they were trying to reduce the government, but it was um, uh, at, at best only in terms of percentage of GDP. Uh, I mean, uh, the part, part of the government, uh, as a yeah, government is growing, but in uh, absolute numbers, yes. it, grows. It, 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 was, it wasn't uh, lowered. So, what would, how would you um, create a let's say perfect uh, political system that uh, in a minimal state that wouldn't allow to sure. back status. Yeah. It would be in a democra democracy, maybe monarchy, I don't know. What would be your solution to have a minimal state that will, unlike US at the beginning... Uh, will so let me state first that I don't think politicians are self-interested. That I, altruists see them. Politicians are unbelievably self-destructive. Have you ever met a happy politician? A flourishing politician? I haven't. Have you ever looked in Bill Clinton's eyes? He's a miserable, pathetic human being. As are almost all politicians. Sorry if there are any in the audience. Believe this. Having power over other people is not in your self-interest. It destroys self-esteem. It destroys your capacity to appreciate your own life. Because how do we get happy? Where does happiness come from? Happiness is not some subjective thing that anybody can be happy in any given moment. That is not what happiness is about. Happiness requires certain objective actions in reality. It requires, for example, that you have self-esteem. Self-esteem comes from achieving real goals. Self-esteem comes from knowing you can take care of yourself and take care of your family by producing something in the real world. It doesn't come from manipulating other people. It doesn't come from lying, cheating, and stealing. And we just said that all politicians like cheat and steal. So they don't get self-esteem. So I don't believe they're self-interested. And I know there's a whole economic theory about how politicians are self-interested. Uh, public choice, it's called. Some of them believe what they're doing is good, but it's not good, and therefore they can be happy. Just just believing something, you try it. I don't believe in this positive thinking. All you have to do is think positive and then it means wonderful. It's bullshit. It's reality that matters. What actually happens in the world out there that matters to, to whether you're successful as a human being or not. Some of them believe that what they're doing is good and we have to change their ideas. Some of them are power lusters. They want power, not because it makes them happy, because, this, because they're corrupt individuals. Just for the same reason as some people lie, steal, and cheat, even though it's self-destructive. They still do it. They can't control themselves. They're emotionalists. They've abandoned reason. How many politicians do you know who use reason? Very few. So, I, you know, we have to be very careful about what we define as self-interest. In my view, self-interest is something very specific from a moral point of view. From a moral point of view, it means behaving in a particular kind of way, and I encourage you all to read Ayn Rand, The Virtue of Selfishness, and I know it's very hard to get in Polish, so try to get it in English, in English it's easy to get. The Virtue of Selfishness, she articulates the moral morality of selfishness, and the morality that leads to human happiness and human flourishing. Now the second part of your question is about how do you establish a government that is limited? Well, look, Nothing is sustainable, nothing is sustainable, unless people believe in it. I, I don't care what structure, I don't care, I know there are probably a bunch of anarcho-capitalists here, that's not sustainable under any circumstances in my view. Uh, but never mind if people don't believe in it. Uh, you might be a, a, a believer, I've, I've heard some people are, believe in a monarchy. There'll be a revolution if people don't agree with the monarch, right? I mean, nothing's sustainable unless the people buy into it. And this is why I, what I'm asking for is not a political revolution where we change the constitution, we change this and that. I'm asking for a moral revolution where we change the moral code that the people are going by. And if we change that, then the political revolution is relatively easy. I think the founding fathers of America got it pretty close. Not perfect, but close. You could rewrite the constitution to make it clearer, uh, more assertive, more clear about the role of government as only protecting individual rights, never initiating force, 
separation of state from economics, from state from education, state from science, state from religion, and ideas generally, and you would have a really much, much better constitution than they have in the United States. But even that would fail unless the people, at least the intellectuals within the people, the people who teach at these universities, were today almost all lefties, right? 80% of all professors in the world are lefties. But imagine if 80% of all the professors in the world were capitalists, were self-interested, right? Believe that a morality of self-interest in capitalism. Then it almost doesn't matter what the Constitution says, you'd have capitalism. You'd have a limited government. So to me, what's important is what the intellectuals believe, because they rule the culture. They dictate what the culture is. When the intellectuals are leftists, we will have leftism. When the intellectuals are capitalists, but with a proper philosophy, we will have capitalism. So, I would change the Constitution. I would have separation of powers, like in the original American Constitution. I would have very limited democracy. You could vote on very few things. And then I would leave it alone. And I think it's sustainable as long as we perpetuate the ideas on which is founded. The reason the American Revolution failed 200 years later, it took it a while, but it failed, is because they never had a philosophical foundation. All they had was Locke, who was a great political philosopher, but had no, nothing new to say about morality or epistemology or metaphysics. We need a new foundation for the principles of political freedom. And again, this is Ayn Rand's contribution. Ayn Rand's contribution is providing that philosophy on which we can ground real political liberty, and this time it will be sustained. Ask because you said that uh, self interest is good and self interest is well. And I agree with you, but what about uh, private charities? Are they useless or outright wrong? I mean, it's my, because for in my opinion, it's like uh, my other business. I give away money and I feel better in, in exchange. And second, well, well, let, me, let, me, let me answer that first. It depends why you feel guilt better, right? If you feel better because you've appeased some unknown guilt, then it's not good. Get rid of the guilt. It's cheaper than giving money away. If you feel better because you're helping a cause you really believe in, you're helping something to really promote your values and therefore promote your life, then charity's fine. It's just not that important. As I said, Bill Gates did more for the world building Microsoft than he ever did in charity. But take other examples. In 1776, the United States of America was a third-rate colony. I mean, the British barely even fought the war. That's why America won, right? By 1914, America was the strongest, most powerful, richest economic power in the world. That did not happen because of charity. It didn't happen because of charity. Not charity existed, charity is nice. But what did that happen? What changes the world? What creates wealth? What helps the poor? Why is from poverty? What annihilated slavery and annihilated child labor? Business. Business changes the world. Charity smoothes out the edges a little bit. And that's good. I'm all for charity. If it's done right, if it's motivated by self-interest, then I'm all for charity. But I'm not for just arbitrary charity, and I'm not for guilt. Because you've made money, now you have to give it away. Which is what motivates a lot of charity in America today. It's the guilt of the businessman. Uh, Just ask a question, I'll repeat it. Okay, so uh, I think most of us here are somewhat connected to the, the liberty and freedom movement in Poland. And I would like to ask uh, what do you think we should do to, uh, to win the war with capitalism as quickly as it is possible? <laughs> Well, first, so the question is, those of you connected to the liberty movement in Poland, what should you do to win the war as quickly as possible? I think first, forget about winning the war quickly. <laughs> this is not something that's going to be won quickly. This is a long, it's going to require a long, sustained effort. Because if you think it's going to be quick, then you'll have a lot of energy in the beginning, and then it won't happen quickly, and everything will die. So the movement has to be built for the long run. So that's one. Second, 
I'm from the Ayn Rand Institute, right? I strongly believe that without Ayn Rand, the liberty movement will lose. Because Ayn Rand, whether you guys want it or not, lays the philosophical foundation for liberty. And nobody else does. Nobody else comes close. Hayek doesn't. And indeed, that's why Hayek believes in a mixed economy at the end of the day. Reed wrote to Sifkham and many of his other works. He believes in a central bank. He changes his mind later. But yeah, there are no absolutes for Hayek. He changes his mind all over the place. Because he has no clear philosophy. Hayek, so Hayek cannot be and will never be a foundation for liberty. Sorry, I know, I know Hayek is the most popular uh, libertarian thinker out there, but he's not that good of a philosopher. He's a great economist, genius economist, mediocre social thinker, unoriginal for the most part, very conventional. You need Ayn Rand, you need a revolution, an epistemological revolution, a moral revolution. You need new ideas. The old ideas are dead. They're destroying us. They're on the status side. Be real radicals. You want to be radicals only in politics and economics? That's boring. Right? The real fun is to be radical in ethics, to be radical in philosophy. That's where the real war, the real war is going to be fought. So to win, you have to promote this new philosophy. You have to promote Ayn Rand's philosophy, not just economics. And you have to bring to the whole thing a real passion, a real love for it. A real love of freedom. But not just a love of freedom because you want to take drugs. It's not a good reason. It's because you want to prosper. Not just prosper materially, but prosper as a human being. The connection between reason and prosperity, in my view, is the most important philosophical connection that Hayek never got, couldn't even conceive of, because he undercuts reason when he can. It's, it's the real connection that is philosophically necessary to win this battle. Reason, self-interest, capitalism. That's the connection. I don't know where the microphone is, yeah. Okay. The aim of Christianity is personal salvation. And it's uh, self-interest, it's personal profit. Uh, and the sacrifice is only way to gain this profit. Christianity says that salvation is the uh, largest profit that, that a person can earn. So uh, it's the, the sacrifice is uh, like when you run a company. And you sacrifice, you work hard, you serve the customers because uh, you want to uh, earn millions of money in the future. The, the same is in the Christianity. You sacrifice because you want uh, to gain uh, salvation in the future. So, uh, so why the uh, Christianity is uh, done is uh, against uh, the uh, philosophy of objectivism? I mean, For me, it is uh, is it's, I'm, it's compatible. I'm assuming you mean salvation in the other in the next world. I'm assuming what you mean. The payoff is to go to heaven. That's the payoff of sacrifice. Is to go to heaven? It doesn't look like he understands me. You must speak louder. What's that? You must speak louder. I must speak louder? Oh, I feel like I'm yelling. <laughs> Do you mean that you sacrifice now so you can go to heaven? Is that the salvation? Yes. So you need some mystical reality that's not real, that's a fantasy, that you don't know is actually going to happen. I have news for you, it's not. <laughs> in order to justify your sacrifice, I live in this world, this world, the reality that is right here and now. I want salvation right here and now. I want happiness and prosperity and flourishing right here, right now. I mean, not right now, but here, right? In this world, I'm willing to invest in long term. To motivate people by a promise of some afterlife, by promise of some fantasy life. I mean, that's ridiculous. And what if I tell you that statism is good in this life and you'll be free in the afterlife? So don't worry about freedom here. 
Which is what the Catholic Church has been telling us for hundreds of years. Uh, no. What was the Dark Ages? What were the Middle Ages? It was the Catholic Church imposing its will. It, it was burning people at the stake. It was putting Galileo into house arrest. All in the name of, it's so going to be okay in the next life. Don't worry about it. Are we going to argue about religion all, all evening? So, objectivism is about this world. It's about your life, not what happens after you're dead. It's about living the most flourishing, the most successful life on this earth. And the only way to do that is by use of your reason. We talked about reason is the way in which as human beings we survive and we flourish. But faith is the opposite of reason. Faith is the negation of reason. Faith tells you, believe whether there's evidence or not. That's the essential characteristic of faith. Otherwise, we wouldn't use the word faith to describe it. So when negating reason in the name of freedom, in the name of what? So, I know you want to be Christian and objectivist. Sorry. I mean, I'd rather you be a little bit objectivist than Christian than not objectivist at all. But to be consistently objectivist, uphold reason consistently, with no compromise and no giving up, which is what I think is required to live the good life, you cannot have faith. Faith and reason are opposites. I have a question. I don't know where the mic is. She has the mic. Yes. Uh, okay, I have two questions concerning two points that you raised. The first one, since I'm guessing most of the people here are capitalists or uh, libertarians, uh, and I know that you guys like numbers, so I'd like to refer to this one number that I read in the Washington Post. Uh, 85 people uphold more wealth than 3.5 billion people in the world, together. Uh, so, yeah, that, that brings me to the inequalities in part. How can we be flourishing and call ourselves a flourishing percent of people in a world with such radical inequalities where 3.5 billion people live in radical poverty? And also, you... So, so let me answer that before we go on to the next question, because otherwise I'll be swamped. So, I'll throw back a few numbers. Uh, one is that since Asia has adopted elements of capitalism, 800 million people have risen out of poverty. From a state in which everybody was poor, now 800 million people are not poor anymore because of freedom. Second, 85 people, 85 people have created more wealth than 3.5 billion. That's the reality. Bill Gates has created more wealth then, I don't know, I'm trying to multiply how much richer he is than I am, but more wealth, in terms of actual wealth, than thousands of me, or maybe millions of me. That's the reality. He has improved the world in a material sense. Thousands or maybe million times more than I have. He deserves every last penny that he has. Now, if you take a farmer in Africa who's subsistence farming, how much wealth is he producing? Zero. Bill Gates, when he creates Microsoft, how much wealth is he producing? Billions, if not trillions of dollars. So yes, Bill Gates is an infinitely number richer because he's infinitely more productive than the poor guy in Africa. Now, why are there three and a half billion poor people in the world? That's an important question. I care about, I don't want to see poor people, no, I really do. I care about poor people more than any socialist I know on the planet. I'm serious. I love human beings. I love humanity. I love people because I love myself and I love life and therefore I love other beings that are alive, particularly sentient beings who can think. And I think it's a massive tragedy that we have three and a half billion people who are still poor. And I know why they're still poor. They're still poor because we haven't bought the capitalism. You want to make Africa rich? Give the, the peasant property over his land. Give him property rights and let him start a business. You know how long it takes to start a business in some parts of South America or Africa? A month or two. You know how long it should take to start a business for a young entrepreneur in Africa or in South America? A day. You should be able to file some document for, I don't know, for tax purposes or whatever, that's it, and start a business. 
So we, statism, socialism, welfare statism, has enslaved the poor. We keep them poor, we keep them down. Capitalism is the only system in human history, the only, emphasis on only, system in human history to be beneficial for poor people. Okay. That's fact. I am She's in the minority in this room. She's in the majority out there, the minority in the room. So respect, respect her courage in standing up and asking a question. It's but good. that brings me to the second point. Yeah. Uh, you said you, you said the the way to you know enrich a, a poor farmer in Africa is to give him the land. Sure, I agree. I agree that Bill Gates has every right in the world to his to his wealth, but. Don't you, don't you think that giving, saying that giving a piece of land to an African farmer is utopia? The main argument that capitalists have against socialists is that they're utopians. You can't have everybody happy, you can't have everybody being wealthy. But that brings me to the last point, the last question, and that is, how can we speak of, of, a, of a utopia, actually, of capitalism, and the other thing that you said about people, the, the basis of uh, capitalism being uh, producing and being, and being able to produce a product. Well, what would you do with all the people that could not produce? The old people, the people who need help? Good question. Lonely people, and, well, I get well, it. people I get it. without any money. So, what first of all, I mean, it's ridiculous to claim it's utopia when for three and a half billion other people it's already happened. Right? Three and a half billion people might be poor, but three and a half billion people are not poor. About seven billion people on the planet, or something like that. So it's already happened to a lot of people. In places like Rwanda, in places like, um, I can't remember, the, the country, I think it's Botswana, one of the countries adjacent to South Africa. Congo. I don't think it's the Congo, Congo is a disaster, but I think it's Botswana. But people are getting property rights. That is actually changing right now. Instead of sending Africa foreign aid, which does nothing to help them. And you can read about the, the corruption of foreign aid, where dictators are funneling their money into Swiss bank accounts. Instead of giving them foreign aid, let's go over there and teach them about capitalism. Let's teach them about property rights. We learned Europeans are not superior to Africans. We're not a different racially superior people. If we could learn the benefits of capitalism, they can learn the benefits of capitalism. Let's go teach them, let's go help them establish this. Let's undo whatever damage we might have done as colonials. Let's bring them freedom to Africa. Instead of perpetuating poverty by handing them checks and telling them everything's okay. You don't have to change at all. You, you'll be fine. Here's a check so you don't starve tomorrow. Which is treating them like children, worse than children. It's treating them as if we're racists, as if we're superior, and we, you know, there's a system that works for every human being who's tried it, every country that's tried it, every race that's tried it, and it works. Asia used to be dirt poor 50 years ago. Dirt poor, just like Africa. And yet the Asian tigers, these little countries, established property rights, allowed for trading, allowed for free markets, allowed people to open businesses easily and legally. And guess what? They're all rich now. South Korea is rich. Japan, which was devastated by World War II, became rich because of capitalism. Not to mention Taiwan, and even, even places like Thailand, which still have a lot of poor people, are much richer than they were 30, 40 years ago. Why? Because they established elements of property rights. That's not utopian. That's very realistic. It's happening every day somewhere in the world. I was just in Colombia, in South America, where there are still very poor people, but they've turned a corner and they're starting to see real economic growth, and poor people are starting to gain property rights, and they're getting better, and capitalism works for them, just like it works for every single country that's ever tried it. There was another part of the question. Now, this is the problem when you ask too many questions. I, I'm getting old, and I can't remember them. Oh, I can't believe it. Well, let, me, let me finish the point about utopia. Utopians, want to change human nature. They want to change the very foundation of human nature. I don't want to change human nature. I want to build a system for human nature. You see, I believe human nature is what Aristotle said human nature is, which is 
Human beings are the rational animal. I want people to live up to their rationality. Not to change their nature, but to live up to it. To rise to the challenge of being rational and using their reason. That's not utopian. That's just high expectations. And I have high expectations of my kids, my co-workers, and you guys. Um, what happens to people who can't take care of themselves? Now first, let me say, that's a very small number. You mentioned old people can't take care of themselves. But old people have had a lifetime to save so that they can hire people to take care of them. In capitalism, you make a lot of money, you can save. Before the welfare state, people used to save. I know saving is unpopular. We're told to consume, go buy stuff. God forbid you should put some money in bank for when you're old and you might need some help, right? Uh, old people traditionally were also helped by their children. There's a certain relationship of children and parents, love relationship, but now we say children, don't care about your parents. Consume, and let your parents consume. The state will take care of them for you. So, take care of yourself is one, if you can. Some people cannot, but if you can. Uh, your children can take care of your family, if we want to broaden it. If they can, some people can't. There's always going to be a small percentage who really, really, really can't, right? But it's a small percentage. So what happens to them? Now let me ask you people, right, this group of capitalists, greedy capitalists, right? How many people here want to see those people who can't take care of themselves dying in the streets? You guys are greedy capitalists. How many people here would be willing to put a few dollars, put a little money, because it's not a lot, because it's a small group, to a charity to take care of these people? How many of you would be willing to contribute to a charity to take care of people who really cannot take care of themselves? Now, there's your answer. The answer is that if we, in a capitalist society, one of the things that happens, and you can see this in the 19th century in America, is people are very benevolent. They care about other people. Capitalism is an economic system of love. Is a new one for you. Objectivism, by the way, is the philosophy of love. We love life. We love ourselves. We love freedom. We love reason. We love other human beings who contribute to our success. We don't want to see people dying. We will voluntarily help them. What we don't accept as capitalists, as objectivists, we don't accept the idea that you have a right to force me to participate in a scheme I don't want to participate in. If I want to help this person over here, I should do it out of my own free will. You don't have a right as an individual, as a group, to put your hand in my pocket, or Steve Jobs' pocket, or Bill Gates' pocket, and take the money out and give it to them. If I want to help them, and Bill Gates is obviously wants to help people, so he's, he's charitable, there are lots of charities, but you don't have a right to force me any more than you have a right to force me to worship a god or a right to tell me who to marry or who not. You don't have a right to tell me what to do with my money. It's mine. I made it. I worked hard for it. It's mine. I might choose to give it to the beggar in the street. I might choose not to give it. Because, you know what? My son needs an operation and I need the money to pay for his operation. Or he needs money for school or whatever. It's my values that should dictate how I use my money, not your values telling me how I should live. And this, by the way, is an ancient debate between two great philosophers, Plato and Aristotle. Plato said, you know what, guys? You don't know what's good for you. You need the philosopher king to tell you what's good for you. You need them to tell you how to take care of the people you want to take care of, what to do with your money, what profession you should have, who to marry, and everything. And Aristotle said, no, each one of us has reason. Each one of us can figure out what's good for ourselves. We don't need philosopher kings. We're the philosopher king of our own life. I'm on Aristotle's side. I have a question. I don't know where that was. So they are distributing the mic. There's an wish. Don't talk to me. Talk to whoever has the mic. <laughs> Yeah, All right, uh, so I want to refer a little bit back to what you were saying at the end of your lecture. Uh, isn't it like the people adapt to the certain political system, economic system they live in? Isn't that they adapt to the environment? Shouldn't the 
economic system go first, let the people adapt and um, make the pursue their own self-interest and uh, just people don't want in the best way that the, the system provides them to. Yeah. So. People don't automatically pursue their self-interest. If they did, we would live under laissez-faire capitalism today. It's in their self-interest to have capitalism. But they don't. We came close to capitalism in the 19th century, and yet we turned our backs on it. We rejected it. So the economic system does not determine who and what you are, and doesn't determine what you will advocate for or against. People in Chile right now have done very, very well at an economy that's relatively free and have twice now voted for a socialist president committed to undoing all the economic progress that they have made. And they voted for it. So it's not deterministic. We're not determined by our economy. We're determined by our, by our deepest beliefs. And those deeper beliefs don't have anything to do with economics. They have everything to do with morality. So what? So I have to sacrifice. Sacrifice is good. Sacrifice is noble. So I'll make less money next year in the name of some social, you know, social utility, some socialist grand plan. People, people, people commit suicide every day, spiritually and materially. So you're not just because you establish capitalism somewhere doesn't mean anybody is going to come. It doesn't mean it's sustainable at all. You need the philosophical foundation for it. So why are Americans voting for higher taxes, more regulation, more controls every single election? Why do they vote for it? Sure they have the power. Sure they have the power. If there was a movement in the United States to move away from statism, look, we get the politicians we deserve. You can blame politicians for all your problems, that's a huge mistake. We get the people we deserve. We choose them, we elect them, we don't run, we don't participate, and we get the people who represent the people. Politicians are chameleons. They don't have, a, they don't have ideas. They reflect back what society wants them to do. That's what they are. They don't come up with original ideas. They're looking at you and saying, oh, I think you're like a tax guy. Oh, that person, he doesn't mind increasing his taxes a little bit. That's what they do. If we all believed in capitalism, we would have capitalist politicians. But we don't. If you do survey after survey in the American street, I, do you want smaller government? Yes. Are you willing to cut one, two, three, four, five? No, 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 no. I mean, people don't really want to cut anything. Do you, do you, want, uh, uh, do you want to do away with the Federal uh, Drug Administration that, that checks our food? No, because I don't trust them. I don't trust free markets. Nobody trusts free markets. So it's a much more fundamental battle. This is why I tell libertarians, as long as you just stay on the economics, you will lose. We will lose. Because people don't care that much about economics. Yep. He wants the microphone, so at some point, pass it back to him. Good evening, my name is Michael, and uh, I'm going to ask you about uh, institutional issues of uh, capitalism. Because uh, you told us about the banks and many people uh, hate banks. Actually, I don't hate banks. I hate banking system because of fractional reserve banking, which is which capitalism is based on the banking system since since the beginning of banking. No, not since the beginning of banking. Beginning of banking. The first money capitalism changes. We're doing fractional. All the capitalism is based on federal reserve actually. And we see, not we true. see that every not true. Every the goldsmiths in London who invented banking. We're issuing certificates for every gold deposit you and then they figured out that they could even loan it at the same time. That's what fractional, the president Fractional reserve banking came before central banking. Okay. That's just a fact, historical fact. Okay, but uh, uh, to, today, uh, this uh, fractional reserve is actually privileged from government, and I think it's unfair, because if I want to have more money, uh, I have to work hard. When bankers want more money, 
Do you, do you know how many hours bankers work? I bet you they work harder than you. Particularly investment bankers. Do you know what hours they work? Do you know to become an investment banker when you come out of college is 100 hours a week of work? I mean, this whole anti-fractional reserve banking, with all due respect, is completely misplaced. There's nothing wrong with fractional reserve banking in a free market. In a free market, there would be fractional reserve banking. It's a contract. The people depositing their money know what they're doing. They know what they're getting. If you want a bank that doesn't have any fractional reserve banking, you can establish one and compete with other banks. There's nothing wrong, in spite of what Rothbard said, with fractional reserve banking. Fractional reserve banking is an important engine of economic growth. Read Larry White and George Soldier, who are big advocates of free banking uh, with fractional reserve, not without it. Um, bankers are hated not because of, of fractional reserve banking, and not because they don't work hard, because that's ridiculous. Bankers work very hard, and they have regulators, you know, breathing down their neck. The financial system is broken because of the central bank and because of banking regulation. And I hate the central bank and I hate bank regulators. I don't hate bankers. Bankers are trying to make a living just like we're trying to make a living. They're using their mind to create profits. To the extent that they're profitable, it means that they're providing me a service. Without bankers, I couldn't have bought my house. Without bankers, this never gets off the ground. Do you ever see Steve Jobs when he got his first check from a venture capitalist, a banker, my, my, ever see him? He stunk. He never, he never showered. He didn't believe in showers. He had long hair, and somebody had was willing to take enough risk on this stinking hippie to give him a check, and that's why we have these. Right? These guys are geniuses. I love bankers. Okay, don't worry, it's, uh, bankers neither. <laughs> but uh, another question is: uh, you were telling about uh, morality and about freedom, but freedom is connected with responsibility. I do what I want to do but I must follow the consequences. So, what do you think about uh, limited liability corporations? Because many corporations have another privilege from government, which is limited responsibility. So again, limited liability is not a government creation. Sorry, but it's not. Limited liability is a contract. It's a type of contract that basically says that the bondholders cannot, the creditors in other words, cannot go after the shareholders if the company goes bankrupt. And the bondholders know this. In cases where it is not the bondholders who are the creditors, that is, that it's, it's, it's a liability issue. The corporate veil is often pierced, what they call pierced, and people go after the private entity. So, limited liability, properly understood and properly practiced, is a market phenomenon. It's a contractual deal. All the government, it is, and that's its history. All the government has done is recognize the existence of this contract. I have a whole course on the corporation, for those of you who hate corporations. I have like a four hour course online somewhere on my view of the corporation and explain in great details why limited liability is not a problem. Again, properly understood. And why it's not a creation of government, but a creation of markets. It's a, it's a necessary creation of markets in order to raise large pools of capital so that we can create large ventures. And you have to have limited liability. You could not have capitalism without limited liability. Hi. Um, I'm sure you, you've read a book, uh, Creature from Jekyll Island by Edward Griffin. Uh, and I think uh, uh, you have agreed with most of maybe all what you as, uh, we can. Could you tell us why he was so much against central banking? And by the way, do you agree with this? Uh, Who are we talking about? Uh, Edward Griffin, a creature from Jekyll Island. Oh, okay, yeah. So, um, I am very much against central banking. It's central planning over the most important sector of the economy. You see, I believe banking is the most important sector in the economy. I think uh, uh, finan the financial industry is like a circulatory system. It pumps blood right now, hearts and our uh, veins and uh, arteries pump blood to where it's most needed. And it keeps us going. It, it provides the oxygen and the nutrients to every part of our body. That's what a good, healthy financial system does. It takes money away from the um, calculator business and puts it into the computer business. It takes it away from the computer business and puts it into the 
you know, this business, whatever, where it con continuously funnels capital to where it will produce the greatest return. In other words, create the most value for all of us. So it's essential to have a well-functioning, profitable financial system. And I consider banks a part of that, venture capital is part of that, private equity, the whole thing. Central, uh, uh, a central bank is basically an institution that places itself as the central authority, the central planner of the financial system. Central planning doesn't work on anything. Hayek was very good at explaining that. The worst, the, the, the most important sector is finance. We don't want central planning in finance. So central banks are the worst type, the worst type of intervention in the economy possible. Now, I am critical of the way he explains the creation of the Federal Reserve in the, in the thing from Jekyll Island, because he places the blame on the bankers. And I don't think they deserve the blame, I think the politicians deserve the blame. But central banking is an abomination. Not only, if you just look at the data, since the creation of the Federal Reserve, we've had less stability from, from a, a banking perspective, from an economic perspective, we've had more cycles, We've had more sharp declines in the economy than we did before. Central banking has destabilized, made unstable, the economic system. So I would like to get rid of central bankers, just like I'd like to get rid of all central planning, and have a market, a market in free banking, a market in currencies, a market in money, a proper market where interest rates don't get determined by some group of bureaucrats, where interest rates get determined by supply and demand. Supply of loanable funds, which means you're saving, and demand for loanable funds, which means demand for business and consumers for lending. And that would make interest rates much more rational, a real price signal in the economy, and much more meaningful, and therefore you would have a much better, much more healthy economy than, uh, than under central banking. So I'm very much opposed to central Unfortunately, that was the last question today. We are running out of time. So once again, I would like to thank Dr. Brook for this very vigorous lecture and Q&A session. Two, two quick uh, informations for you. Uh, on, the, on this little table, uh, back uh, near to the, to the entrance, you will find uh, those small booklets, let's say. Those are the essays uh, by Ayn Rand and Dr. Brook as well. So feel free to get a free copy. There is something like a free copy. <laughs> no free lunch, but a free copy there is. <laughs> And the, the second uh, information is that please uh, please visit the uh, official website of the Ayn Rand Institute since uh, the institute is launching uh, its European, uh, let's say, Euro, uh, I, I Euro. managed to do One more thing, follow me on Twitter, <laughs> like me on Facebook, <laughs> thank you. Listen to your shows, listen to my radio show. So, so, so check out the information about the establishment of Enron Institute Europe, which will be launched next week in Copenhagen. So, thank you everyone for coming.